character study. I always like to do that sort of thing. And we're going to be looking at an incident in the life of David. It won't be a news story to you, it's one you've heard. But there's a lot of lessons to be found in this story. It's going to be about David and his relationship with Bathsheba. The title of this lesson is Lessons from a Rooftop. David had taken a nap. He woke up and in the Want of the day went up on the roof for some air, which was probably a pretty common thing to do. The problem is his neighbor, Bathsheba, was bathing herself. Evidently, Bathsheba was a very attractive woman. Now, when David should have turned away, and left the roof, he stayed too long. And you know the rest of that story. After the sin was committed, there were other sins to follow. But what I want to do tonight is kind of look overall at some of the things that we learned from this incident. First of all, we learned that adultery is sin. And with this kind of sin comes other problems. The righteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. We know that. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Do not be deceived. You know, a lot of people today has deceived themselves that this kind of behavior is normal because of the Humanist Manifesto and other things of that nature they have convinced themselves that there is no such thing as a sin and between two consenting adults it's fine but notice the Bible didn't teach that do not be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, or adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Will not inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible teaches us, the book of Romans, that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It also teaches us that the wages of sin is death. What about the consequences of adultery? You know, they're far-reaching. The list that I'm about to give you was by a student involved in, a, in, a, in the ministry. His name is Philip J. And it's been kind of adapted, but I want you to listen. I think he was right on with some of the complications that arises because of it. First of all, one's relationship with God will suffer. How many of you have read closely and studied Psalm 51? Okay, I'm going to give you homework. Read carefully and study Psalm 51. And you'll see what sin does to this man David and how he reacted to it. One would suffer from the emotional consequences of guilt. Sometimes the guilt can be so heavy a burden that it will cause people to do strange things. It would break the trust, the fellowship, 
and the intimacy of that person's mate. I'll get into this in a minute. The family would be angry and disappointed. It will affect the whole family. Your influence suffers. I have known preachers who made the mistake that David did. As a result of it, your influence was totally shot. I personally didn't think they had to, but they all, that I, every one of them that I've known, quit preaching. I mean, we all sin, we all, but that's, I'll talk about that a bit later. But the influence will suffer. And the guilty will always be looked at with a question mark and considered a hypocrite. The marriage could end in divorce. One's health could even be affected. Now, all of these are possible and some probable outcomes of this sin. I want you to see the progression of sin. In James chapter 1, 14 through 15. First of all, the desire comes. Then the enticement. Then when that desire is conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it matures, brings forth death. Notice it has a progression. And it can be stopped. It should be stopped at the enticement or the desire. You know, the 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, flee also youthful lust. Notice what Paul says, flee. That means quickly get away from it. Flee youthful lusts. But pursue. Now if you'll flee after something, here's the things you flee after. Righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call the Lord out of a pure heart. You know, in Joseph, Joseph, in Genesis 39.9, we have the story of Joseph. We all know the story. Potiphar's wife took a liking to Joseph. Evidently, Joseph was a handsome man. And she took this liking to Joseph and tried to manipulate him to join with her. And he wouldn't do it. Well, finally, one time there was no one in the palace. He just him and her, she grabbed for him, and the Bible says that he flee her grasp, left her holding his coat. He was innocent of anything. He had done nothing, but yet he ended up in prison because of her lies, because she was humiliated that this man would have turned her down. And so she lied to her husband. And in anger, Joseph was incarcerated. All because of sin. The sin of desire. The sin of enticement. In Psalm 51, verse 4, I mentioned Psalm 51. I'm going to look at it a couple of times tonight. Psalm 51 deals with David's confession of sin and also deals with his uh, behavior in trying to get the forgiveness of God. And it's a powerful book. But in verse 4, he admits to the Father, against you and you only have I sinned. He recognized the fact that sin is against God, even though 
it had a wide range of effects to those around him, it was still against God. And I have done this evil in your sight. He knew that God was aware and would punish him for his sin. You know, there is a saying that I dearly love. Andy Griffith was one of my favorite television programs growing up and almost even to this day. I love the reruns. My hero of that story is Barney Fife. I think I have a lot of uh, resemblance and uh, actions like Officer Fife. But one of the things that he liked to say, if something was going on, he said, we need to nip this in the bud. Now, you know what that means? Sure you do. Man, you cut the head off the snake. You kill the bud and you don't have to worry about the plant. And when we're talking about sin, we've got to nip it in the bud. What is it? Buddy, kill it. Kill that desire. Matthew 5, 27. You've heard that it was said to these of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say, there's that contrast. Here's what the law said, but I'm going to tell you something. I've got a more perfect way. If you look at a woman for the purpose of lust in your heart, you committed adultery already. So stop it before it gets to the point of adultery. Stop it before it gets to the point of actually the lust. You know, when you look at David, David should have done exactly what Joseph did and got off the rooftop. Whatever it would have taken for him to remove himself from that temptation, he should be willing to do it. One sin can lead to another. David is considered a friend of God. A man after God's own heart. And yet we see that this man sinned. And that sin was against God. And it began by the look. And then the actual act of adultery took place. And you know what happened. She became a child. Now what's David going to do? He's the king of Israel. Really, David could have done anything he wanted to. It didn't matter. But what he chose to do was one of the most horrible things imaginable. He called Joab. Called Joab. But he called Joab to him. He told him, engage in battle, have Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, in the forefront, and then withdraw the troops, except don't tell Uriah. Joab carried it out. You know, Joab isn't innocent in all of this. He saw that it was carried out. He saw that what David had planned was carried out. And then the result was Uriah was killed. So now, on top of adultery, David is guilty of murder. And Joab was complicit in that murder. He brought Joab into it. You see how far this thing went? And you know what? He's trying to cover it up. He's trying to make it look where he's innocent. So to cover it up, he had Uriah, who was a loyal soldier in the army of David. He ordered him killed. You know, folks leave the church in degrees. Have you ever noticed that? 
A man don't wake up one morning and say, you know what? I think I'm going to apostatize. I think, I'm, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quit going. That's not what happens. You know what happens? First of all, you've got the mindset. In his mind, he loses that spiritual edge. Assembling with the saints don't mean as much to him as it used to. And so he begins to waver a little bit. Not right off. In time, he or she misses maybe on a Wednesday night. Then on a Wednesday night and Sunday night. Before long, they're just Sunday members, Sunday morning members only. Then before long, they're not even there. They're gone. It all started because they lost their spiritual edge. I want you to think about that. How about you? I mean, you're here tonight, but where will you be next year at this time? Will you be here? Are you committed to remain faithful? That's what it takes. You know, there's people. I cannot stand what happened with the pandemic. I can't stand the way it was handled. I don't like the way a lot of churches handled it. I was talking to a fellow the other day. And he said the church that he attended no longer have a Sunday night service since the pandemic because nobody comes. Talk to another fellow. Their attendance has dropped by about 25 or 30 members because of the pandemic. Well, that may be an excuse for a lot of them. My point is, it doesn't just happen, it comes by degrees. So, as Barney would say, you got to nip it in the bud. Where it starts? Right here. Keep that spiritual edge. We've got to remember something. Even the most righteous man can fall. That is David. As I mentioned, I've known preachers that have been caught in some sin. When I was at Preston Road, there was a fellow, an ex-Marine, husband, had three children, and big as a mountain. I really like Manus. But for some reason, he panicked. And he cheated on a test. Oh, that's a small thing. It was sin. Here's the tragedy. He was approached by the dean and requested repentance, which was the right thing to do. And he refused. First of all, he started denying it. Then he, the teacher came in there and said, you can't deny this, and showed the proof. Ended up, this man left school of preaching. I heard later he left the church. I don't really believe that Manus thought for one minute that, that it would end ended up the way it ended up. Good people, good men sin. Do you think David got that morning and said, hey, I'm going to commit adultery with Bathsheba. You think that's the way it went down? That's not the way the Bible reads. 
He was up on the roof. And by the way, this was, this was the time of the battles whenever the kings were usually with the troops. Well, David didn't think enough of the, of the battle against the Edomites to join this, this uh, forage, so he didn't go. Had he went, the story might have been different. Had he been with his men, but he wasn't. Had he left that rooftop, rather than staying there just a little too long and saying Bathsheba, things would have been different. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. What I'm trying to tell you is we can't look at ourselves as if we're not vulnerable. It was the Apostle Paul. Now, this is an Apostle talking, okay? He said, I buffet my body and bring it into subjection every day, lest when I preach to others, I myself be disqualified. What? Paul, you're an apostle. You've been chosen by God. But he realized the flesh is weak. He realized it was possible, even for an apostle to sin. Well, Peter denied Jesus three times. We have to understand it is possible. None of us, not a one of us, are beyond sin. It may not be adultery. Sin is sin. We will reap what we sow. Galatians 6 verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh reaps of the flesh corruption. He who sows the spirit of the spirit reaps eternal life. You know, one of the things that happens whenever we sin, especially sin like adultery, it affects others. It affects others. In David's case, not only affected David, it affected Bathsheba. Not only did it affect Bathsheba, it affected Uriah. It affected Joab. And it affected a little baby that died at birth. Years ago, I've mentioned this before, I had been counseling with a young couple that was about to get married. They were on the way to Sears to get a television. They were on a bridge going across Lake Levon. Meanwhile, there was a lady who was very angry at her husband, and she had been drinking and was drunk. And she got on that bridge, and the bridge was not near enough for three lanes, it was just two lanes, not even a shoulder. In her drunken state, she pulled over into the lane of this young couple and hit him head on. Killed him instantly. Now what had they done to deserve that? Absolutely nothing. But because of the sins of this woman, they lost their life. Their wedding became a funeral. And she ended up spending about seven or eight weeks in the hospital with her injuries. She didn't get to go to her fiancé's funeral. You see, sin can affect people around us. It can affect our own families. You know, as bad as that is, I'm going to say this, that woman could get forgiveness. 
I don't know if she ever did or not. I don't know. I know when the court case came up, she was very contrite over what she had done. But I don't know if she ever returned to God. We cannot hide our sins. There's no way. But if you do not do so, then take note. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out. It told on David, didn't it? Proverbs 15, verse 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. There's a little boy sitting with his mama in church. The preacher quoted this passage. But the Lord is everywhere watching. And the little boy, when the collection plate had come around, the mama gave him 20 cents for the collection plate. The little boy gave 10 because at that time you could buy an ice cream cone for 10. So he said, okay, we'll split the difference. I'll give Christ, the Lord 10 and I'll keep 10. And then the preacher said that. The Lord is with you. The Lord knows it all. So he bowed his little head with a broken voice said, Lord, I owe you 10 cents. The next time a contribution plate was passed, he gave his money back. You see, we owe the Lord our very life. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, Paul wrote, in, or the writer wrote in Hebrews 4.13, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The next point to me is the most crucial. This is the one I want to really consider. No sin is too great that can't be forgiven. How many of you ever heard of Jeffrey Dahmer? Have you? Nobody's heard of Jeffrey Dahmer? Oh, well, we got a few hands going up now. Well, let me tell you about Jeffrey Dahmer. He was a mass murderer. He was guilty of cannibalism. You know what that means? In fact, I believe there's a movie coming out now about Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm not sure if that's... Yeah, there is, I believe. Pretty sure of that about shortly before his execution and I, and I think that was about five or six years ago he requested a Bible study now the end result of that Bible study is Jeffrey Dahmer was baptized for the remission of sins now I don't know the man's heart but God does but let me tell you one thing that man can get forgiveness of sins if he was sincere as horrible and as rank and as disgusting as that may be, he can be forgiven. And if he can be forgiven, surely I can. I know David was forgiven. Now some things have to change. But look at this, 1 Timothy 1, verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. Exceedingly abundant. Two things that just, that just strikes me in this. First of all, his sin is abundant. Or his sin. His grace is abundant. In other words, it can cover anything. And then he adds exceedingly abundant. There's nothing His grace can't overshadow. Now listen. 
with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is the faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul was very humble with the reality that he himself had persecuted the church and had been responsible for the death of a man by the name of Stephen. He knew he was guilty. And yet he also felt the forgiveness by God's grace. Can you imagine the load that was taken off that man when he realized that those things that he had done can be forgiven? You know, first you have to realize that you've sinned. <laughs> and not like that lady who in the gospel minutes years ago said, I have never sinned. What? She is a bold-faced liar. Don't say, I have never sinned. Because each and every one of us have sinned. Or the Bible says we make God a liar. But there is no sin that we can't enjoy forgiveness. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. I read about the, the unrighteous that went on to inherit the kingdom of God. But notice the next verse. And such... Watch this. Fornicators, sodomites, homosexuals. And such were some of you. Idolaters, fornicators. And such were some of you. But, I love that word but here because here's the contrast. You're not like that anymore because you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. In other words, they were baptized for the remission of their sins, so they were washed. And now that blood of Christ has sanctified them, separated them from the world, and made them holy. If you are a Christian, you have sinned. And God, through His grace, has forgiven you of that sin. If you have been washed. And if you have repented. Psalm 51 verses 7 through 10. This is the second psalm. I want to, the second part of that psalm I want to look at. Purge me with hyssop. I shall be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. That the bones you have broken may rejoice Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart. God can do it. So, we need to be washed. David said it. Paul said it. We need to be washed. Arise. Be baptized, Saul of Tarsus was told. Have your sins washed away. Acts 22, verse 16. But you know, there's something else that has to be done. We've got to quit sinning. Can't be a Christian and enjoy holiness with unholy living. It won't work that way. So we've got to repent. Jesus commanded, Luke 13, 3, repent or perish. We've got to, to do it about face and quit walking a life of sin. If we confess, He is faithful to forgive us. 1 John 1 verse 9. 1 John 1 verse 7. Walk in the light as He is in the light. Have fellowship one with the other. You see, there is forgiveness. Even if we are Christian in sin. That's what 1 John 1 is all about. God knows, man. God knows how weak the flesh is. Just as he gave the, the one who's never been baptized a way of salvation, he gives those who are Christians a way of forgiveness. 
Again, the first thing that has to happen is we have to realize we are in a sinful condition, a sinful state. And then we must call on God's grace. Then we must obey the plan that God has given us. That plan which is to repent, confess, to be baptized if you're not a Christian. If you are a Christian, then just to repent and confess in whatever you are, whatever state you're in, begin to walk in the light as He is in the light. And as He is the light of the world, we become illuminators of that light. Don't be caught in sin. You need to come and encourage you to do so while we stand and sing together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power?